So Derek, of course, is a professor of neurological surgery, even though um, the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology like to claim him. He is really part of our department. And Dirk uh, grew up in Las Vegas. He is not a Raiders fan. He informed me he's a, a heartbroken Vikings fan. Uh, and the reason he is a Vikings fan is because he did his medical degree and his PhD at the University of Minnesota. So he's sort of a gopher in that sense. And um, he did his uh, graduate, his postdoc in neuropathology uh, here at the University of Washington. Of course, everybody knows him because he's the chief of neuropathology. He's a professor in uh, ophthalmology, neurological surgery, and lab medicine and pathology. Um, what's unique about, I, you know, I shared a grant with him, uh, um, a wonderful grant, and was one of the best academic experiences I can say I've had. I've learned so much from him and Ed Lee. But um, Dirk has over 30 active NIH funded grants. Let me repeat that, 30. That's in addition to his nearly 300 peer-reviewed papers. Um, he has, I, I can go through all the things that he has developed, invented, discovered, um, but that would be his entire talk. And so I'm not going to do that. We all know who Dirk is. We love Dirk. He's about 10 feet down the, the hallway from us and uh, part of our department and just fabulous. So Dirk, thank you for being here at seven o'clock in the morning. I know you probably I interrupted you writing another grant uh, or doing some research. So um, tell us a little bit about your insights. Uh, thanks, Rich. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna start off talking about that wonderful grant that we shared. So um, presumably, People can see my screen. Is that working? Yeah, beautiful. Nice. All right. So, um, so this is a this is kind of a summary of the progress that we've made um, uh, since that really uh, transformative uh, grant that we have, and and what has what has really led to uh, where we now sit. I think in the um, uh, you know as as a real driving force as a foundation for uh, for a lot of what's happening uh, to, to try to understand the normal human brain, how it's built, how it is connected, how it works, and, uh, and then how that relates to disease and injury. And so that's kind of what I'm going to try to talk about today. Uh, let's see, I need to make sure I have a pointer, and I need to be see if I can figure out how to move things. So I can't I can't start any talk at this point without acknowledging the incredible people in the neuropathology division. We've been we've been uh, we've been really fortunate to have recruited some incredible faculty. Uh, we're one of the largest neuropathology divisions in the country, and and a lot of that is due to our relationship with the neurosurgery department. You can't be a great neuropathology division if you don't have a great neuropathology department to work with. Um, and then and then it goes from there. I want to just highlight. The incredible faculty, including uh, most of us who have research labs and research programs and grant funding, not just me, and also our fantastic uh, trainees that are coming up. Uh, in fact, Megan Chambers is are her finishing her last year in neuropathology and will be taking a faculty position at Stanford. And Dan Child is finishing his uh, neuropathology fellowship, and I'm sure you know both of them. And he'll be staying here. Actually, we're really we're really really lucky to be adding another physician scientist to the neuropathology division. And so uh, so thank you all for your support for the neuropathology division. None of us could be doing what we're doing without you. Uh, and so we, uh, I'm here to summarize the Brain Lab. And what does the Brain Lab do? The Brain Lab is really, uh, uh, you know, the platform to study human brain tissue and human brain function and human brain pathology. And so we absolutely start with diagnostic expertise, but but a critical component of what we do is we function as a biorepository. And the reason we have a lot of grant funding is because we're able to collaborate with people all over the world using this biorepository combined with the innovation that we that we strive to continue to develop uh, and promote uh, within our group and, and outside over uh, over time. 
uh, and then and then of course uh, that all leads to supporting local and national research and and we have a I think a really strong training environment where we're training the leaders that are going out to many other universities now and and helping with this kind of work. But as I said, I wanted to really highlight uh, the aging dementia in TBI study. Rich can tell the story. I, I, can't, I can't tell the story, but essentially at some point, Paul Allen goes to Rich Ellenbogen and says, you know, what is this CTE stuff about? How can I help? I have this brain institute. What can I do to help? And uh, Rich was, uh, I was very fortunate that I was working with Tom Montine and, and Rich approached us and said, you know, maybe we can do something other than what everybody else is thinking about, which is looking for CTE in football players. And so that's when this, this aging dementia and TBI study was born. It was born to, out of the Group Health Act study. So this is a study of community pathology, neuropathology associated with TBI, which is in reality, if you think about it, much more impactful and much more relevant than studying really high level athletes and what's happening in their brains. And that was already being done. And so I think this was highly complimentary and really visionary. And so uh, long story short, Rich and Ed, and this was my introduction to Ed, which has been just absolutely transformative. Uh, and I uh, wrote this grant for the Paul Allen Foundation, which was funded thanks to, to Paul and his vision. And, uh, and, and away we went. We used the uh, the ACT cohort, which is a community-based cohort with over a thousand brain donations at this point, but at that time it was 500. And we were one of the first studies to really to really focus on multiple brain regions with multiple modalities in a really comprehensively characterized cohort to try to understand the the transcriptomic, the neuropathological, the, the sort of signature that, is, that happens in association with TBI. And, uh, and we, we leveraged a lot of uh, new technologies based at the University of Washington, as well as the Allen Institute. And, uh, and again, this was a, this was a, um, a, a really unique and, and uh, I think um, visionary study in, in that we took all of these methods, we took the brain tissue that we had optimally preserved, we thought, at the time, and it was really a tour de force to try to to try to discover the molecular signature, the molecular profile of what happens when you've had a TBI, and um, we developed this really big rectangular data set that included demographics, it included all the neuropathology and disease metrics, it included TBI exposures. We were one of the first large scale uh, digital pathology studies in in autopsy to focus on. Uh, the, to connect neuropathology and transcriptomics. And you ended up with this, this big data set that, that was really powerful uh, in the ability to potentially identify the, the signature, the neuropathological signature, the biological signature of TBI exposure. And this is still being used to this day uh, really heavily at the Allen website. Everything's freely available feel free to go there anytime. It's, it's a lot of fun and, and it's pretty good. 10 years, 10 years later, it's still being heavily used by a lot of groups. And so we found a lot of the things we expected, right? We had a mixture of people that were, these were all old people. They, a lot of them had dementia, a lot of them had Alzheimer's disease. And so if you look at all the metrics of associations between Alzheimer's pathology and cognitive impairment, et cetera, that's all this is showing is that basically people that had dementia had high pathology and that's great. That's what we would expect. We also found that the, in the transcriptomic profiling, the transcriptomic profiles varied by brain region. We would expect that. And remember, this is bulk. Right, we're taking the RNA from a piece of tissue, mixing it all together, and then sequencing it. So you can't really talk about individual cells or anything at this level, but we were seeing the kinds of profiles that we would expect to see in, a, you know, in a in a in a in a in a in a um, uh, uh, that, that you would expect in a trend in a, in a study like this. And 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 we did find a lot of correlations with pathology. Right, there were a whole bunch of genes, for instance, that were associated with tau and tau levels. And so this is all great. It's all not super novel, right? What we were focused on was traumatic brain injury. And um, and we weren't finding that. The, the main finding that we did have was that the RNA quality was really associated with dementia. And that had been 
that had been hinted at before, but this was a really solid uh, foundational paper when it comes to really trying to understand the impact of dementia and end stage disease on on the quality of the tissue and 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 maybe maybe that's the wrong way to say it right on the RNA integrity that isn't necessarily a tissue quality thing right people who are at the end stages of neurodegenerative disease have a lot of uh, a lot of issues that are going on in their cells and so the RNA quality was was really problematic and so we published this in eLife uh, and that was great. But but the focus was on traumatic brain injury. And so what the heck, right? We, we weren't finding a TBI signature. So we went back into the ACT cohort. We got everybody in the ACT cohort. We had 107 people that had TBI exposure. And this is, of course, self-report. And then 425 essentially controls. And we took every instrument, every application that we had to study these people uh, in association with this with this grant and other grants at this point, to try to find the t the signature of TBI in uh, in, uh, in 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 the late effects of TBI in the community, and so we used histolide, which I've presented at this meeting before, which Tom Montine invented, um, which is really a really innovative uh, quantitative neuropathology approach that still continues to give you histo histopathology. And this is you don't need to think about all this, but we were basically looking at quantitative tau and other uh, markers, but tau and A-beta in our whole TBI cohort. And then we actually had a TBI cohort of people that were lost consciousness for greater than an hour. So this was a significant you know, TBI. I think it would be probably characterized as severe. Um, uh, although I defer to you guys on this stuff. Uh, and then of course we had a, a subset that, that had frozen tissue. And so you don't need to, to look at this except to say, you know, we have no TBI, TBI, and high TBI or, or, you know, severe TBI. And there were no differences in any of these quantitative pathology measures with association with TBI. It was crazy. And here's the, you know, here are the statistics. And, you know, we found a couple, a couple associations in hippocampus that are probably age related uh, rather than TBI, the really TBI focused. And so the bottom line is we did all this work and we weren't seeing a TBI signature. And so we thought, what, what, what the heck? So we went ahead and, and did, you know, are we seeing an association with this quantitative pathology in Alzheimer's disease? And sure enough, that's there. So it, it, it suggests that the measurements we were, our measurements were accurate and were, and were identifying the kinds of associations we would expect, but there was no signature of TBI in this, in these 500 people. And so we, we went to, we went back to the basics. We took these histolide slides, and we said, okay, let's look for CTE, right? That's our last shot. We don't have any other signature. And so we took these stains and we screened 530 some, uh, 532 people for CTE. And this is, as you as you all probably know, the signature lesion, the pathognomonic lesion of CTE that I was, uh, and our group was a part of developing over the years uh, with, uh, with, with the NIH. And you see this perivascular, glial, and neuronal tau in the depth of the sulcus. And so we looked for this in our histolide slides, and we found out of 30 or 40 people that had some candidate staining. And so we went back and did traditional neuropathology on those 30 or so people, and we were able to identify three people out of 532, right? Again, three people out of 532 people out of the community that had CTE neuropathology, and none of them was really essentially associated with TBI exposure, which was really weird. Now, remember, these are people who are super old, right, 80s to 100, and we don't have great history on what they were doing back when they were 20, uh, and, you know, uh, contact sports were different back then, the military was different back then, and so we did have a person associated in the military, but the bottom line is the burden of CTE in the community uh, in a in a in a in a cohort like this is really not very significant, and I think that's really really important. Uh, but why 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 is that? And so um, so this was a, essentially a negative study, and you know how fun it is to publish negative studies, but we did in Frontiers, and and then started really thinking about uh, you know what does this tell us? And so um, I, I want to really emphasize how foundational. The TB, the aging dementia and TBI study was. It it connected Ed and I, uh, uh, which I don't know if it would have happened other than that. 
it also really opened our eyes to the challenges of the of the technology at the time and the approaches at the time where we were doing bulk transcriptomics where we were using cohorts that were you know that were people who were enrolled prospectively who were you know uh, in 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 good shape and we didn't have any really TBI focused cohorts either right that was the other problem nobody was really studying TBI in a prospective c- controlled manner which is the way you need to do science you can't just have people all coming to your door saying i'm worried i have cte or their families and and then making broad claims about you know what that means for the community you have to study the community to understand the impact of the community and i think that's a problem to this day with respect to cte research so uh so we so we we um we really realize that there's a big gap in resources right and and that's the first issue and um, and that comes down to the assays, right? So do we really think that people who've had a TBI with loss of consciousness exposure have no long-term consequences? Probably not. I, I think there probably are. Um, what they are, I don't know. Um, but, but whatever we were doing, uh, if there are consequences, was insensitive uh, to detect that. And so, and so we, we, we set about to reinvent how we are uh, approaching this kind of research. And it has really propelled the University of Washington neuroscience group generally, uh, and the neuropathology group, of course, um, uh, to, to really prominent and important uh, levels of impact in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the community, in the research community. So I've shown this before, right? Back when we started all this, we, were, we had histology and quantitative path and then we had built in really innovative approaches, which were still not that great because it was sort of this bulk omics, bulk proteomics, bulk transcriptomics, uh, et cetera, that we had that we had deployed in the in the aging dementia and TBI study. And so where we really wanted to go and where the field was starting to go and where Allen Institute was leading the way, and this is why this was so critical was in going after single cell, highly resolved single cell transcriptomics. Uh, single cell multi-omics were starting to, to come about in a lot of experimental systems. And spatial omics, spatial transcriptomics were were start were sort of sort of getting underway at that point, right? Murfish was 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 being developed uh, at that time. And so we took a step back and said, how do we ensure that the people who are donating their brains to research at the University of Washington are um, really are honored. Their gift is honored by us trying to have the maximal impact possible from that gift, which means we need to have their brains in a state that can be used as much as possible for every research application that there is. And most importantly, the, the research applications that that currently can't really use the, the tissue uh, that is that is banked or using the methods that are being uh, appro- applied for that. And so and so we sort of took a step back and reimagined how we do things and everything we uh, we applied to the brain lab, which was born out of this, uh, was focused on single cell transcriptomics. And I don't need to go through this. This is a slide from Ed that I think he probably showed when he did Grand Rounds. And uh, it's basically, I think everybody knows, right? You take uh, brain tissue and you um, and you isolate the single cells in in human it ends up being single nuclei and you are able to basically sequence that that transcriptome from that cell uh, it turns out you need tissue to be reasonably intact if you want to do that and throwing tissue in liquid nitrogen tends to be very destructive actually to cell membranes to nuclear membranes uh, you, you, you 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 don't think about it this way but Freezing in liquid nitrogen, actually, you form a you form an insulating bubble of of, of vapor uh, of of gaseous nitrogen, which then prevents that tissue from freezing really quickly, uh, which means that you end up with a lot of uh, ice crystal formation and a lot of damage to that cell. And so it's kind of counterintuitive, right? We've all worked with liquid nitrogen, so we need different ways to freeze tissue so that we don't have that delayed freezing. It freezes very quickly and very uniformly. And it turns out we've been doing that in neuropathology for decades for muscle biopsies. When you take a muscle biopsy, we actually do enzyme uh, studies, right? Uh, right, um, uh, Where we need to, the, the enzymes to be intact in that muscle biopsy, which means if the cells are all broken up, it's not going to work very well. 
And so that uses isopentane, supercooled isopentane. And so we, uh, the Allen Institute had picked up on this before. They developed this, this approach, which we adapted and, and improved upon. And I've shown this before, but to this day, it's working incredibly well, where we're taking these brains, we're embedding them in alginate and cutting them very thin. Four millimeters for a fresh brain is really difficult to do. And we're doing it very consistently so that you get these nice slabs that are then frozen on these Teflon coated plates in super cooled isopentane, right? So the isopentane is put in dry ice. It's, it's cooled down to where it's uh, it's basically starting to freeze, uh, to solidify. And, uh, and it, it turns out that protects the cell membranes, the nuclear membranes really, really well because it, 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 it prevents that sort of insulating uh, reaction to happening. And so the, the transmission of, of heat out of the tissue happens very uniformly and very quickly. And so that tissue ends up being in really good shape. And I, 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 I haven't looked in five or six months. We might be at 600 plus, 600 plus of these, of these uh, donors right now. But it's been remarkable since 2019 how this is how much this has impacted what we're doing, and this is one of many slides that just highlights the, the tissue quality that we're seeing, which is really surprising to me. Even RNA quality, which you wouldn't think would be affected by liquid nitrogen versus isopentane, the RNA quality, the RIN values, and maximum RIN is 10. In autopsy tissue for the aging dementia and TBI study, we were really happy if it was greater than five. In single cell RNA seq uh, experiments, you really want it to be greater than seven. And for most of our donors, it was up in the, uh, you know, up above seven in the eights and nines, um, which was really remarkable. And then the, the, there's different assays and it turns out the PICO, which is, uh, which is the picomolar assay, which is really focused, used for extremely scant specimens, doesn't work so well on abundant RNA and we get a lot of RNA out of the brain. So, so, uh, so the, the, the different applications Really worked really well, and also for methylation, uh, methylome uh, attack seek applications, this the system worked really well. We were really surprised and really happy. And so, and so as part of this reimagination of the brain um, uh, and and brain donation and, and tissue isolation, we realized, you know, uh, having great tissue quality is is really important. But if we can't see the pathology. Uh, you know, we're, we're missing out. We're really missing out. And, and, um, and I have to take a pause here, right? Christine McDonald, um, uh, of course is, is near and dear to everyone on this, on this, uh, on this meeting. Uh, but just as much as the, the relationship with that Rich and Ed and I developed through the aging dementia and TBI study, uh, I, you know, the work that, that Christine has been doing with us and, and my relationship with, Christine and her impact on our program and, and everything downstream in our program is just one of those, you know, career develop defining things that, that you just hope happens uh, once or twice in a, in a career. Um, you know, I'll know Christine has uh, unlimited en energy and knows uh, something, if not a lot about just about everything. Um, but she has, she has basically put ex vivo MRI totally on her back and has carried our program for years now uh lugging it's like tons of brains uh over the years lugging them to the university of washington to get them imaged on the weekends every other weekend and i don't know what the numbers are every time i check it's way more but it's at least 700 750 brains that christine has imaged uh, a resource that is of tremendous value uh to the world but uh the reason I bring this up is because we can see pathology with MRI that we can't see as neuropathologists, right? So this look, this is stridum. There's a big vascular uh, lesion in here, and you know we really can't see anything grossly, but you can see on the MRI that the MRI picks this up. This is really great for white matter hyperintensity. So we've done we have a lot of grants now that Christine is really driving, focused on understanding the pathology of white matter hyperintensities in aging in uh in our cohorts and uh and lots more to come we have a really exciting grant building off of the single cell omics that we're, pre we're preparing now but maybe even more importantly uh is the is the quantitative amount the quantitative data you get from imaging right i mean 
Christine's figured out a really innovative way to, to apply FreeSurf for Tammy brains. And then she's able to, to generate hundreds of data points from each brain of volumetric data points that we, uh, that we actually present uh, in our clinical pathologic conferences that we use on a day-to-day -day basis to, to assess our brains. In fact, she comes with her laptop to every brain slicing that we do. Uh, and she's there pointing out the lesions to the team to make sure that, that we're getting sampled uh, all of the different lesions that we can't see. Uh, I think this should be standard practice in neuropathology, to be honest. I don't know how we'll ever get there, uh, but we need to because it is, uh, we're seeing pathology that pathologists never see. Uh, and we're seeing, uh, we're, and we're and we're learning a lot about what what the underlying basis of that is. Anyway, uh, we in, we incorporated ex vivo MRI into our neuropathology process with Christine uh, a long time ago, and that has been really really critically important and something that we've been advocating for all brain banks uh, to to try to do. Uh, I showed this before. We really expanded the assessment that we make of each brain. So this pink list of uh, of regions is what a normal, very good brain bank would do. We've added another 60 plus brain regions uh, based on TBI exposure uh, and areas of the brain we think are vulnerable, but mostly based on structural and functional MRI. And so we've even incorporated a whole bunch of sites that are critical and functional connectivity networks. Uh, that will help us understand the relationship between pathology and brain function, rather than just the the you know the sort of uh, stereotypical progression of pathology across the brain, which is what most of us do at this point. I think this is also going to be incredibly important as we start to correlate what we're seeing pathologically in these brain regions that few people ever look at, with how people are 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 presenting and progressing. And, uh, and doing uh, from a functional perspective. We're collecting digital pathology on everybody now. We have quantitative approaches that I'll talk a little bit more about when I get into the Alzheimer's disease project that we're doing. Uh, but suffice it to say, the digital pathology is, has, is an integral part of our process. And again, uh, I think that's a little bit easier pill to swallow for most clinical and research uh, diagnostic uh, programs, uh, but it still is a long way coming. And we've been very fortunate. We're part, we're leading or part of three national uh, projects to develop a resource for digital pathology banking uh, at, for it to, uh, for a repository to be accessed and, and then uh, developing ways to quantify those, uh, those digital images, particularly for Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases but that's coming, and the UW Brain Lab, I think, is leading the way in a lot of ways with this digital pathology. And so, so we 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 said, okay, we need to re envision how we're assessing these brains, how we're collecting and preserving these brains. But we also realized that the ACT study is the wrong study to really be looking for substantial TBI effects. And why is that? Well, the ACT study randomly invites people to join the the, the study out of group health, which is now Kaiser, if you make it to 65, right? And so, and then once you get invited, if you say yes, you come in for initial assessment and you get to be an act if you don't have dementia. Well, it's possible, maybe even probable, that a person with a significant traumatic brain injury isn't going to be really all that great and healthy and, and cognitively or, or behaviorally intact at age 65, right? A really significant TBI is probably going to have impacts before that. And so we realized we're, we may not be seeing a signature in ACT because we're seeing the survivors. We're seeing the, we're seeing the people who somehow avoided problems from their TBI. Uh, and so how do we do that? Well, we needed to go find a study that is really focused on following people with TBI with a neuropathology endpoint uh, that don't require you to be healthy and, and cognitively intact at 65. And there were no, there were no studies out there. There are zero brains out there to study, to, to, to meet that requirement. And so we started to really think about ways that we could contribute to the research, um, uh, to, re to TBI research in the United States, uh, and certainly locally to study the questions we were interested in, uh, at the source, right? How do we how do we find people that can donate their brains that have had TBI and the appropriate controls? And 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 from that, 
the Pacific Northwest Brain Donor Network was born. Desiree Marshall was a fellow at the time. I think everybody probably knows Desiree, who's now at Snohomish uh, County Medical Examiner. But we went and we've tried to uh, think about a, a new way to do things. And so what do we do? We went and uh, developed a program that essentially uh, embeds within different medical examiner offices. And this has taken years to develop, by the way. But we have generated their trust. Lisa uh, Lisa Keen is our is our project manager that that sort of leads these efforts and is the liaison to these medical examiners and has earned their trust to the point where or they've they've invited her into the electronic uh, records. And so we see in real time in some of these some of these uh, institutions um, uh, the donors that are coming through and and we coordinate with the medical examiner to see if it's okay to approach for donation. We've done this now. We have we have developed the the brain donor network as a sort of hub and spoke model. We we initially did this for TBI, and so we were looking for people with military or sports, just anybody with TBI. And we've we've collected a couple hundred now donors in the TBI process. And and I'm not going to spend a lot more time talking about everything we've been able to do since then. Uh, that would be a great opportunity for Amber Nolan to come present at this group and talk about all the incredible TBI research that's coming from this uh, from this cohort. In fact, I think we have two or three grants now and another one that's going to be reviewed in a couple of days that are really going to leverage um, this work. But the other thing we did is we said we need controls. Uh, and simultaneously, we were sort of thinking about all the challenges we had had with the um, with uh, with the um, with the omics and stuff from our um, from our uh, older cohorts, and how do we assess sort of normal brains, and where do we get where do we get controls? And so we just we decided to to work with the Allen Institute, who was who was, were currently getting their brains from San Diego, and so uh, and so that was causing huge PMI problems and tissue quality problems, and so we worked together to use the PNBDN to screen for normal adult donors, uh, and this was really an important. Uh, application that we didn't we didn't think about right away when we were building the PD, PNBDN, but this is the way you're going to get neurotypical brains, right? You're not going to get neurotypical brains in prospective cohort studies of normal people because they'll age out into the point where they're probably not going to be neurotypical. You need people who die unexpectedly and tragically, which is really unfortunate, but that's the way you're going to get neurotypical brains. And so, so Lisa is, is taking point and our whole team is basically ready 24-7 when we get a person who has a TBI history or a, or has a potentially normal brain, and that has really a, allowed us to springboard into the the, the critical uh, research that Ed Lean talked a lot about, right? Ed Lean in his talk talked about a, a lot about atlases, and and um, the 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 sort of first one uh, that that we were able to participate in because this was the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network. Ed's talked a lot about this, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But the BICCN was really developed by the NIH in, in, with a huge investment to develop the technologies and to start to map mostly the mouse brain, but to but to begin looking into monkeys and humans with the ultimate goal of of developing a cell atlas for human brain. And that was wildly successful. And 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 uh, and fortunately, some of the brains that we were able to get early on were able to be used for this, where we were able to focus on motor cortex. And when I say we, I say that's the Allen Institute and a lot of other collaborators. But that ended up being really impactful. We ended a, a special issue in Nature in 2021, and three of the three of the publications in in that special issue were based on Brain Lab PNBDN donors. From the Allen Institute, and that was really, really important and, and special. And no, I can't die. There we go. And so I think you know you remember this slide from Ed's talk, probably. Uh, BICCN then became BICA and the Brain Initiative Cell Atlas Network. So the BICCN was really build the tools and and build the atlas of the of the mostly of the mouse. BICAN is the current iteration of the Brain Initiative. Again, with a huge investment of money that is that is really geared toward developing a human brain cell atlas. And of course, the Allen Institute is prominently uh, configured in this. And, and this has involved a big effort that Ed talked a lot about, and I won't spend a lot of time in. 
I do want to highlight, though, when we were in BICCN, one of the issues that we had uh, was, you know, you could go focus on a certain brain region. We did motor cortex, and it's pretty easy, you know, anatomically to be able to identify that. When you start thinking about building a, a, a brain atlas of human brain, you need to be much more precise when it comes to the anatomy. And that ultimately can't be done, I don't think, without functional MRI, at least, to really understand individual brain uh, neuroanatomy and, and neurophysiology and where you want to target for certain functions. But in lieu of that, we have to, in lieu of not having functional MRI, which you're not going to have in anybody coming through a medical examiner, uh, we need other options. And so um, at the time, it was basically a, a, a matter of picture matching, right? So this is the Allen Brain Atlas, that that um, uh, the Ding Atlas, and it's really an amazing atlas. And you know, you just have to take a slab and try to match it to the to the right picture. We thought we we can do better, and so we started developing ways that we could do that. The first iteration was using a handheld 3D scanner, you know, like you'd use for a laser printer, and scanning the surface of the brain, and that's what you get here. And you know, those scanners are six eight thousand dollars and then our, our good friends at mass general eugenio and bruce fischel and others were able to take the 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 pictures of the brain uh which are here and then to reconstruct using that 3d scan so they use the, the surface scan to stitch everything together to then uh be able to apply you know current uh atlas current mri based atlases to those to those brain regions and you end up with um you know something that is reasonably uh, more detailed and more connected to uh, current whatever atlas reference you're using. And so you're able to parcelate those, those slabs. And that's kind of where the field is at, right? In fact, NeuroBioBank, uh, which is the NIH National Brain Bank of multiple sites, and several other places are, are already adopting these methods to, um, uh, to, um, to their, to their, to their brain uh, biorepositories. And that's been really great. But of course, right, um, you know, we want to do better. And again, I, I, here's a here's a huge shout out to Christine McDonald and the Pagan Endowment, uh, the, her endowed chair, um, for, for having the vision to say, what about a portable MRI? How about we get rapid MRIs on these folks? And so uh, she went out and found this ICU-based portable MRI the, called the Hyperfine. It's like 0.067 Tesla or some crazy little amount. In fact, you can stand right here with your phone and credit cards and everything and nothing happens. Uh, but anyway, she bought it or leased it and uh, and installed it. And we've been doing these cadaveric scans rapidly, which has resulted in, uh, again, it trans it's transformative, right? We're the only group in the world that's that's doing this. There are several that are that are now trying to get their own hyperfines and probably many more, but you get this rudimentary MRI that when Christine and Eugenio and others sort of do their magic uh, with, uh, with stuff I don't understand, but they basically use this SynthSR application to really uh, refine the imaging, you end up with a, a pretty good looking scan of a person that took 40 minutes. Uh, and this is cadaveric, right? This is This is a person who's died, who comes into our lab and before we remove their brain, they go through a, an MRI scan. What does that do? Well, that again allows us even more accurately or precisely uh, to parcelate the brain in these folks. And so you're able to take and and do the standard sort of parcellations that you would do in an MRI, but then you can apply that to the actual slab photos as you're going through. So that when we're going through and dissecting different regions of these brains, and we need to dissect 200 different regions for the brain cell atlas that we're building for human, you can do it much more precisely. I'm not going to talk about the fMRI applications that we're doing, but Christine and Kimmy Demoto riley and Tim Brown and, and many, many others are working with our group to recruit people from hospice to participate in functional imaging uh, and then potentially donate their brains. Uh, and we're, we're hoping to find people who don't have neurologically significant reasons for their uh, for their position on hospice uh, so that we might be able to increase even better our precision by by having function localizing MRIs um, that uh, Nancy Kanwisher at uh, MIT has developed 
uh, in conjunction with Christine and Tom Grabowski and others to really give us the, the precision regarding the functional function localizing uh, activities in different people's brains. I think that's going to be really important eventually. At the next grand rounds or two, we'll talk about that hopefully. So this is our approach. You've seen this from Ed. It's it's really summarizing everything we've done. I think it's 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 really been transformative and will help us uh, to really achieve the goals of BICAN, which is to develop whole brain cell atlases across uh, not just mice, but neuro non-human primates and, and humans that will ultimately be connected to, to brain function. Uh, as part of BICAN now, our group is uh, is sort of leading the way with all the other groups that are involved. So that's Neurobiobank, that's UC Irvine. We're gonna have more people coming online with the next round of grants. And this is just a summary, and I think Ed had presented this, of all the accomplishments that we've been able to make since basically devising this new approach um, uh, that really started again with the brain aging dementia and TBI study. I, I just can't emphasize how important that was to this. So um, this is this is a, a just a slide. The other thing we've ha had to do is to sort of reinvent how we select donors for for these studies, and we have a whole process now that incorporates a really comprehensive uh, overview of everything from clinical history to toxicology to infectious disease testing, neuropathology, and then all the neuroimaging and other things that are going in. And this has been a real important uh, lesson in how to um, develop a diverse cohort that incorporates everything from tissue quality to Im important clinical histories. And this is a work that's that's ongoing. And so BICAN ultimately re will result in, as, you, as you've heard, a, a cell taxonomy, uh, a spatial map of those cells, and, uh, and a reference that people can use to really associate with their disease of interest. And with that, I want to transition into the CAD uh, project that we have. This is this is kind of the the next logical step from the aging dementia and TBI study from the dementia part. Uh, this took Ed and I a while to put together. Um, uh, and again, you know, I can't I can't emphasize how important Rich's uh, support not just for the aging dementia and TBI study was, but the bridge. That we uh, that we had to get to to this U19, which is a big U19 and is really having an incredible impact. Uh, and and Ed talked about this, so so you know I guess maybe I don't need to spend a lot of time, but I do want to emphasize the neuropathology components a little bit stronger than he did. And so what is CAD? CAD currently combines the Alzheimer Center and the ACT study, and those are highly complementary studies for the University of Washington, right? The ADRC is really a biological study of Alzheimer's disease. You know, it's it's very deep, deep phenotyping, very frequent phenotyping, whereas the ACT study is this huge, huge cohort of, uh, of just, uh, it's more of an epidemiological cohort. And combined, we have incredible power, not just to see the biological processes that underlie Alzheimer's disease, but how that impacts the general community. And so this has been transferred. It's unique. There's nothing like this. Um, I've shown this in the past. This is just really to highlight the diversity of pathology that we see in aging. This side are the people who don't have dementia in ACT and ADR in ACT. This side are the people who do have dementia. And each of the different colors represents a different kind of neuropathology. So Alzheimer's disease, TDP43, Lewy bodies, or vascular. And it's remarkable how many people that don't have dementia have a lot of pathology, first of all, right? We this, this cutoff is sort of a cutoff to what we would think would be relevant for dementia. There's a lot of pathology in old people. We're all getting it. I mean, it's just unavoidable. And so uh, that's really important to understand. And then of course, people with dementia have a lot of pathology too. And then there's a few weird people that, that have dementia without pathology, which just means we can't, we haven't figured out what to look for yet. Uh, but this is a this is a wonderful cohort in that we can we can see the changes that happen before a person gets demented. We can see what happens to people, hopefully, how they how they tolerate pathology without being demented, what we call resilience. Uh, and and we're really excited about this about this cohort. And so uh, I, I believe Ed showed this. This combines quantitative neuropathology with um single uh, nucleus and spatial omics. That's what CAD is doing. Uh, again, this is this really couldn't happen without this process that we've developed. And all this does is highlight the 84 donors that we've used so far. 
and the quality of the tissue and the range of pathology. We have a range for AD pathology. We have, uh, of course, they're all pretty old. Uh, and then the RNA quality is really, and the tissue quality is really outstanding, uh, including many people that don't have dementia, right? This is really important in that we don't have dementia in a lot of these folks. We're focusing on multiple brain regions, again, building off of the aging dementia and TBI study in that we can't just learn everything from one brain region. We really need to understand how these pathologies are evolving across a population and a cohort. And so that's been uh, incredibly important. And we're following the pathology at this point, but ultimately we'll be looking for functional, uh, rele functionally relevant areas. Uh, we are incorporating digital pathology in a, in a very unique way of quantifying seven different uh, seven different targets that um, are being done in a, by layers, by cortical layers. And I can't tell you how much work this has been. Janelle Ariza uh, from our lab, who's now working at Allen, unfortunately, um, developed this and, and is just an amazing amount of work. So we're able to analyze pathology and neurons and glia and everything across all the cortical layers across multiple regions based on this. We have dozens and dozens of, of quantitative endpoints. So instead of saying it's BRAC2, we have 12 different metrics for tau. It's so much more powerful than what we do as neuropathologists right now. and something we should be trying to incorporate into standard practice, in my opinion. Um, the Allen folks have brilliantly gone and taken a principal component analysis with this combined neuropathology burden and developed what they call a continuous pseudoprogression score. So they've basically rank ordered people based on their pathology using this, uh, this PCA that has been, been used and been critical, essential for the interpretation of the of the of the molecular omics data that's coming down the pike and so and this has really been uh really been transformative as it really correlates right cassie scores are the 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 um the higher the score the better and so these are these are the high scores and people that are less affected and so brock stage of course the higher the score is bad and so you see that this correlates very nicely and so what the Allen folks and Ed have done is they've gone and taken this CPS, this continuous progress, uh, progression score, and compared that to effect sizes across cognitive status or Alzheimer's disease, neuropathologic change, the traditional things that we do. And lo and behold, the effect size is really quite dramatically in increased with this continuous progression score. Uh, this has been able to identify vulnerable neurons, both excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, and glia, astrocytes and microglia. In fact, it's identified some new populations of microglia that we weren't really associating with, neuro with neurotypical brain. Uh, and, and, and really, finally, it's, it's, it's been really interesting to where we're finding some unexpected changes in that the high-stage high AD cases are actually split into two groups, one that is really severely affected and has a much more, much more, uh, much quicker uh, trajectory of decline, than others and and the tissue quality metrics that we that we assessed in uh, that we published in uh, aging dementia and TBI are probably due to that population that we didn't know about before, and then finally, uh, you know the pseudo progression the CPS allows us to sort of predict which cells are going when, and so it's identifying interneurons which are not something we typically think about when when we think about tangles as a vulnerable population early so the somatostatin neurons particularly which is giving us a whole new target uh, to try to understand the earliest stages of AD, which is the point of CAD, right? We want to find the early cells that are affected and, and protect them. That's the goal. So, uh, so Ed showed this. This is a really nice summary of, of everything that we're doing in CAD, ultimately resulting in a web product. This is the product. It's out. You can see it. I think we have three brain regions up now, uh, and and we are going to do more. We still have eight more brain regions to go for this first iteration, and our competitive renewal is proposing to continue this, but in a, in a larger population cohort across a, a network of brain banks that I've helped uh, to develop that I think will be incredibly transformative, particularly from a diversity perspective, right? The one problem we have in Seattle uh, uh, at least with the cohorts, is a lack of diversity, and that's an in, in so important. And so the next area of emphasis for us is going to be to try to get a much more representative cohort for the for the population from several different diversity axes. 
Uh, future directions, we have a lot of spatial omics that we're doing in addition to developing a bigger cohort. And we're going to focus down using some of the new technologies. In fact, we have uh, we have two new cosmics instruments in neuropathology, uh, uh, in part thanks to neurosurgery, really, that are going to help us do combined proteomics and transcriptomics in a spatial manner that it's really unprecedented. And, and I think we're going to be able to really target the cells that we've identified with this early component of, of CAD. So, uh, so this is the way we, we, I think we should be practicing neuropathology, right? We, we need to have cohorts that are representative. We need to do a great job of getting those tissues isolated, protected, preserved, characterized, that will then be amenable to the, the 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 latest technologies like these like these omics approaches that will hopefully give us more information to be able to develop our experimental models and so that's our goal we're continuing to it's going to be a, a fight that we won't we won't uh, we'll keep going until i'm done and the rest of us are continuing to go and i think we I think it's paying off and so huge group of people uh you know the allen institute has just been incredible all of my neurosurgery colleagues, a lot of our other UW colleagues with the Alzheimer's Center, uh, and then my group uh, and, and the people that are really directly associated with us. And then so many families have been contributing to this now. And of course, we have lots of funding. And so with that, I think I'll stop. I hope I didn't go too late. And well, you, uh, you were fabulous. I'm giving you a standing ovation. Um, uh -huh. No, it's really amazing uh, what the group you and Christine, Ed, Edlene, Christine McDonald, yourself, and uh, Tom Grabowski, uh, are really pushing the field forward. The, both the ACT and the ADRC uh, have been instrumental and probably, arguably, one of the mo richest bio depository repositories in the world. And you guys built it. I mean, the science, you know, I mean, you add AI onto this and you're going to be making even more discoveries, uh, you know, the elusive of why uh, the dementia, why the CTE. Uh, I mean, I see in our lifetime, maybe we'll have a better insight into what it is. Um, so it, just amazing work, Dirk. And it's uh, I'm just honored to call you a friend and a colleague. Uh, any any questions we have for Professor Keene? Speak up. <clears throat> John Lozier. I just thought that was fascinating. And I think back to when I started in neuropathology as a resident. I spent six months with Buster. It was the best six months of my residency. And uh, it, you guys have just come so far so fast. It amazes me. Yeah, really, uh, the omics have really revolutionized what you're doing. And then the single cell uh, isolation that Ed does. I mean, a lot of these technologies, his slide, you didn't even go through how you invented that, how you discovered that. I mean, I think that's such a neat story, but that's another grand round. Um, the technologies you've invented to be able to do this research. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Rich. And, and John, thank you so much for bringing that up. As some of you know, we just celebrated Buster's 100th birthday, uh, and we are planning a, uh, a, 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 a symposium in the spring in his honor that really focuses in on the areas that he not only was interested in, but really led the way in, in promoting. So, you know, that's autoimmune, uh, autoimmune disease, multiple sclerosis, the the a lot of the forensic neuropathology that that he did and of course his work in neuro oncology and so uh stay tuned we're trying to bring in some some really important people who are are have benefited from everything buster did and of course i was his last fellow i can't tell you how fortunate i feel like i was even though buster could be pretty tough sometimes uh but it made us all better and so um so thank you for bringing that up and yeah i think all this is I think Buster would be so thrilled to see this. And I think a lot of this, none of this really could could have happened if he hadn't built such a strong foundation in neuropathology here at the UW. I agree. Yeah, any other comments, Christine? You want to, uh, do, do you have time to comment on your perspective? You're I want to 
uh, travel laptops. So I apologize, I don't have video, uh, but no, I just, it's been extraordinary. And, and I think Dirk said it best, truly transitional, transformational um, with everything we've done. And, you know, to the point of, you know, informing disease, but also informing the patient. And I think one of the things that Dirk didn't talk about, um, and it's really Dirk at the helm that makes this what it is. Um, it is so kind and humbling to hear the comments he has made about myself and Ed and Tom Grabowski and others, but it's really because Dirk is at the helm, because it is him that this is what it is. Um, and I, I think that's important to acknowledge. Um, but it's also, it's, it's the disease, but it's also down to the family um, that Dirk invites the families in, that we will spend hours with them going through all of the findings to share what we have found, not just in the publications, but at the level of the patient, the knowledge back to that family who may be wondering why their family member changed their behavior, started acting the way that they did, why you will hear families say, you know, my, I lost my wife in 2012, and then she died in 2017, because of these terrible diseases that they experienced, and that Dirk truly at the helm is allowing us the opportunities to better understand these, that don't just inform and change how we think about disease and population as a whole, but truly have transformative uh, impact at the level of the patient and the family. And I think that's an important contribution that not all neuropath cores, and I'm sure I can tell you not all neuropath cores do out there. And because he is good at the microscope, but also good with the family, that that is allowed to happen. Uh, that's important. And neuropathologists oh, good. Part of it. I'll stop there. Yeah, right, Christine? Neuropathologists good with the family families. That's almost an oxymoron, but he is. Yes, a, sir. <laughs> It's a very kind, it's a very kind and true statement. He's very kind with the families and they love him. Christoph, you wanted to say something. Maybe He's not. Gone. He's gone. Okay. Well, Dirk, you know what? Um, it, it, I, I, I'm really excited about hearing more. Um, and I hope you promise me that you'll come back every year, give us an update. On, I mean, ACT has just been an incredible resource. And truly, you know, I, I just reviewed a paper from Mayo Clinic Proceedings on Biorepository. This is really one of the most spectacular assets that we have at UW. I want everybody to know that we, um, uh, the chair of of lab medicine and pathology and a group of us have ensured that we have nailed Dirk, not literally, Dirk's feet to the ground and he's gonna stay here. We were able to uh, retain Dirk here instead of him going off to Stanford or another place um, where he was heavily recruited like most of our faculty are recruited all the time. So Dirk, thank you for staying with us. Thanks for being here. And I look forward to you next year, giving us an update on where you are with this great uh, research. Um, thank you very much, Dirk. I'll see you later today in the office. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. All right. Have a nice day, everybody. Nice week. Thanks, Dirk. Bye.